Hey, it's Dr. Centeno, and today I'd like to talk about a really important topic, craniocervical junction instability. You might be saying, what's that? And this is the lecture that I gave in Clearwater, Florida, to the American Academy of Orthopedic Medicine. And I'm going to try to aim this somewhere between physicians, which is what uh, is down on these slides. And as I speak through the lecture slides, I'm also going to try to make this a little more patient friendly. Bottom line is this is about a procedure that we developed that's really the first in the world of its kind to inject the alar and transverse ligaments. And I'll tell you what those are. So from a 30,000 foot view, instability in the craniocervical junction or the upper cervical spine uh, is common when the ligaments are just stretched. It's not so common of a situation where the ligaments are actually busted. And regrettably, the surgeons in this area mostly focus on when the ligaments are totally busted, and that's a rare event. It's much more common that ligaments in this area are stretched and they're causing a lot of problems. And how did we get into all this? Basically, we had a patient that had, or sorry, we had a practice that had a lot of these patients. We would do our traditional interventional workup and do some facet injections and we'd go up to C23, which is the joint that's supposed to cause headaches. And some of them would get better and some of them didn't get better. And then we would go to the next level, C1, 2, and C0, C1, and go higher in the neck. And again, uh, another segment of patients got better. And uh, we really became quite experienced in injecting the upper cervical spine. And while some patients had a good short-term block uh, at C0, C1, or C1, C2, these are joints in the neck, uh, others would not get better. So we started to ask ourselves the question, what was going on with these patients? They clearly had upper cervical problems because we could numb out their pain, but they weren't getting better when we injected things like PRP and stem cells into those joints. So a primer on the craniocervical junction. Basically, as babies develop, it's pretty clear that the head and neck are one unit and they develop together. And hence, your body really can't tell the difference between a pain coming from your brain and a pain coming from your upper neck. It's all the same. So a problem in the upper neck will cause headache. The upper neck is also very rich in position sensors and all of that information is coordinated with information that comes in from the eyes and the inner ear. And when the position sense of the upper neck is off, you can get dizzy. And the original name for this syndrome is syndrome of Barlio, probably not important from a uh, patient standpoint. So bottom line is uh, when you try to provoke pain from the upper cervical joints, this is what it looks like. You tend to get pain referral patterns into the head. Now, there are two very important ligaments for CCJ instability. One is ALAR and the other is transverse. Now, the best way to describe the ALAR ligament is if my body as I'm standing represents the dens and I go up with my arms and reach above me, my arms would represent the ALAR ligaments grabbing onto the skull. So they are the ligaments that come out kind of from the side and go upwards. Uh, and then a transverse ligament would be if someone put a seat belt around my waist, uh, a transverse ligament is kind of like a seat belt for the dens. Now, I don't want to get too much into this from a patient perspective. You can certainly read the slide, but the bottom line is that these are the ligaments that hold your head on. And the most interesting thing about the alar ligament is when you turn your head to the right, the left alar ligament gets tight, and you turn your head to the left, and, it, and it's the opposite ligament that stabilizes this area. Transverse ligament, again, acts as like a seat belt for the dens, so it's a pivot point. It, it secures that pivot point where 50% of all your cervical rotation occurs, uh, and that's at C1, C2. 
But what causes these kinds of things? Basically, trauma to the head, motor vehicle collisions, uh, lots of different issues where patients strike their head or put pressure on their head or something falls on the head. And the typical patient, activity makes everything worse. They've got headaches, which can sometimes be made better by very specific types of chiropractic or physical therapy-based manipulation. Uh, and other associated symptoms can vary depending on the severity of the instability. Uh, therapy makes them, physical therapy makes them worse. And pretty much any injection type therapy only helps them a little bit. Now, this is what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to avoid an upper cervical fusion because some of these patients go and get this surgery and it's a huge surgery. Uh, and so we don't really want to put screws in your skull and put screws in all the other upper cervical vertebrae and then throw some rods in. So that's what we're trying to avoid with this new injection technique. So can we manage CCJ instability? Uh, yes, but first we got to be able to image it and see if we can make the diagnosis. So that's through dynamic motion x-ray, rotatory CT, upper cervical MRI, a DMX is just a and open your mouth. That's perfect. That's perfect. Right here to right. So moving shoulder. type X-ray allows us to see if these bones are aligned Both as you move. Mostly the C1, C2 bone. Rotatory CT is a CAT scan where you turn your head, and the bottom line is that uh, some research has shown that this can also help make the diagnosis. MRI imaging has been interesting because some original studies uh, seem to show that this was a very good way to look for injured ALAR or transverse ligaments in the upper neck. The more recent research didn't support that as well, but it was really poorly done. So the research that's well done, the early research, uh, really seems to support that MRI probably has a role in looking for these damaged ligaments. Traditional prolotherapy, which is ligament injections for this kind of problem, really have not been all that promising because the bottom line is that you can't get to the ligaments you're trying to treat. So how do we get to these ligaments? About a year and a half, two years ago, I started to noodle this, this problem and I finally recognized that there was a little gap in the front of the C1, C2 articulation. So this is this model that I was looking at uh, in the office, and you can see what I call an articular gap, a little hole between the C1 and C2 bones from the front. And if I went through that gap, I could get into the ALAR and transverse ligaments directly without going through the spinal cord, which is in the back. So uh, this is an injection from the front. From the side, this is what it looks like as well. One of the issues was that the tongue needs to be depressed because it's in the way, and this is an injection that goes through the back of the throat to get to these uh, ligaments. This is the device that we ended up using. It works very well to keep the tongue out of the way. And bottom line is that this is, uh, this, this is where we place the needle in the back of the throat area. In addition, uh, this is not the kind of procedure that should be done by someone who doesn't have massive amounts of experience injecting the upper cervical spine. It can't be done under ultrasound, only x-ray imaging, and definitely shouldn't be done by, by a uh, naturopath. It's gotta be done by an MD or DO. It's an anesthesia-only procedure. We use some very special things to accomplish this. And this is what it looks like. This is a uh, just a 25-gauge needle, a very thin needle. The patient uh, is under uh, IV access anesthesia here, so they're asleep. Uh, and uh, we're placing the needle under x-ray guidance in this picture. I use a little device that allows me to see the back of the throat and where I'm uh, placing the needle. And this is what it looks like on an x-ray picture. And these are some additional x-ray pictures showing uh, this, in this case, some uh, injection into the C1, C2 joint, which I don't want. And in this case, a perfect ALAR ligament injection, or in this case, a perfect transverse ligament injection. Bottom line is, of the first 10 injections we did in seven patients, 
five of them responded really well after really responding to nothing else that we had done for these patients. And some of these things were quite remarkable. We had a patient who went uh, backpacking and hiking, and that would have been impossible for this woman because I treated her for 10 years uh, prior to this. Uh, another woman who was able to go cross-country skiing and who could now sit through meetings where she couldn't do that before. Uh, of the two patients who didn't respond as well, one of them had a suboptimal injection and the other really had another problem and he had a poor workup. And uh, so we believe that he was inappropriate for this procedure. So in summary, injecting these lig ligaments is possible. It can be performed. It appears to be safe. The results are very promising. And we're going to now move into more research-based mode to try and quantify these results. And please don't try this at home. This is a complex, high-level interventional procedure that can only be done by a handful of very highly trained physicians in the United States. So thank you so much, and I really appreciate you listening uh, to this lecture about a very unique, novel, first-of-its-kind uh, way to inject these problematic ligaments.